Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning is Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. We never give angels more attention than we do at Christmas time. It can't be helped. They're so marketable. But besides that, many of our classic Christian passages, our classic Christmas passages of Scripture, excuse me, include angels. In the Gospel of Luke alone, which is where we've been the past couple of weeks, we read of three angelic appearances, including our text this morning. And each appearance follows a similar structure. First, the angel appears. Then, the one that they appear to expresses some form of fear or disturbance, a typical response in the Bible to appearances of angels or the divine. Then the angel says, do not be afraid, and gives an announcement or news. And this multi-layered level of repetition is not by chance. Luke, the good historian and good author of the Gospels that he is, wants us to pay attention. Indeed, the angels demand our attention. How could they not? They're angels. But for as much as our attention is demanded by these angels, theologian Karl Barth is right to note that, quote, they refuse to be set systematically in the foreground of our interest. The appearance of the angels isn't about the angels. They are about God. The very definition of angel says as much. That Greek word is angelos, which means in its simplest dictionary sense, messenger. Now, just yesterday, I was watching the Netflix series, The Crown. They're in the fourth season now. They're covering Margaret Thatcher's tenure as prime minister and, perhaps most importantly for many, they're covering Princess Diana, the late Princess Diana. And in one episode, Diana is responding to fan mail with handwritten letters, something that she was very well known for doing. Now imagine receiving a handwritten letter from Princess Diana. You wouldn't waste any time gawking at the mailman or observing the intricacies of royal letterhead. No, you would tear open that envelope as fast as you could because what is most important is not how the message has arrived. What matters is the message and who it is from. So it is with angelic appearances. Angels are important not in themselves but because they come with a message, with news from God concerning what he will do or concerning what he has done. And each message in Luke 1 through 2 is accompanied by a sign, 
a demonstration of divine power and faithfulness, which tells us that the question is not whether or not God will do what he says he will do. The question is not whether God has done what he says he has done. The question following each and every angelic appearance is, having received the news of the work of God, how will you respond? So how did Zechariah respond? He comes first. Zechariah was a holy man, a priest, burning incense in the temple as was his custom when an angel of the Lord appeared to him, saying, your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth, who was barren, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. John, who we know as John the Baptist, was to be a prophet of the Lord, going before the Lord to prepare his people, to call them to repentance, so that they would be ready for the coming of the Lord. The message, in its simplest sense, is God is coming, and the prophet that will go before him will be born to Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Zechariah's response? Disbelief. How shall I know this? He asks, for I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. This is actually kind of surprising coming from Zechariah. He was a priest. He knew his scripture. He was a Bible-reading man. He knew the story of Abraham, how God promised Abraham and his wife Sarah a child in their 90s, and that the child Isaac was born, and that from that child Isaac came innumerable descendants leading all the way to Zechariah and Elizabeth themselves. They don't exist if 90-year-olds can't have children, if old men and women cannot have children by the promise of the Lord. So this angel's message should have set off fireworks in Zechariah's imagination, stirring him to glorify and praise God for involving he and his family in his redemptive purposes. But it didn't. It didn't. Because, I think, it's often the people most familiar with the story of the scriptures that are most prone to doubt their place in that story. For all our knowledge of the high points of God's work in human history, of his work of creation, he spoke heaven and earth into being with the very word, the promise to Abraham, the Exodus, the Davidic covenant, and now for us, most preeminently, the death and resurrection of Jesus. For all of our knowledge of that, all the Bible verses we remember, we still have a hard time that God is at work in our story, our stories Maybe we're trying to be modest. You know, sometimes you get to hearing someone talking about what God is doing in their lives, and it sounds less like rejoicing and more like sanctified humble bragging. More often, however, I think we're being self-deprecating. We belittle ourselves. We consider ourselves unworthy or, or unqualified. Our prayers count for less. Whatever the case was for Zechariah, Good news came to him. He responded in disbelief. What about Mary? How did she respond? She comes next in Luke's lineup. We spoke some of Gabriel's appearance to Mary last week. Mary lived in Nazareth. She was a teenager, engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, and she was a virgin. And the angel appeared to her and said that she would be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and that from her would be born one whose name would be Jesus, who would be, the angel says, son of the Most High, and who would be given the throne of David by the Lord God to reign over the house of Jacob for all eternity. This announcement, like the one made to Zechariah, is laid on thick with biblical language. Behold, Isaiah says, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And the Virgin Mary's response, despite whatever confusion and curiosity she doubtless felt, was that of trust. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be in me according to your word. A response and a prayer that you and I would do well to emulate in our own lives. And this took some serious courage, too. Don't miss the cultural significance of what Mary was signing herself up for. She was running the risk of being considered an adulteress. 
a misdeed which in antiquity could have cost her not only her marriage, which we read about in Matthew 1, where Joseph, before he knew what was happening, resolved to, Matthew says, divorce her quietly. But it not only could have cost her her marriage, it could have cost her her very life. Think about the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. They were getting ready to kill her. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5 says, a verse that Mary must have clung to for dear life as she responded to this angel, to this news in trust and acceptance. Good news came to Mary. Mary responded in trust. Now we're back to this morning's passage. We've worked our way to Luke 2. How did the shepherds respond? Out in the fields doing their honest blue-collar work, the shepherds encounter an angel of the Lord. But the message is no longer about what God will do. This angel brings good news of great joy for all the people concerning what God has done. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Savior, Christ, which in the Greek, uh, which is the Greek transliteration of the word Messiah, and Lord, each title packed with theological significance, each title packed with cultural significance. There were political rulers who went by Lord and Savior, and each title indicating in their own way that to them a king has been born, to the world, the king has been born. God has kept his word. Salvation is born in Bethlehem. How will the shepherds respond? Well, we don't get the answer right away. The normal flow of angelic appearance stories is disrupted this time around. Suddenly, Luke says, a multitude of the heavenly host praised God singing glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. The angels respond to their own message, and their song reads like a call and response. Glory to God. Why? Because born on earth is the bringer of peace. Born on earth is God's shalom. And if this is a disruption to the narrative, it's a welcome one. It's a hint at the appropriate response to the work of God. And the shepherds take that hint, responding to the angels by imitating the angels. They, from here, become the messengers. They make haste to find Mary and Joseph and the baby. And looking upon the child, Luke says, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. That's the thing about good news. The best news is impossible to keep to yourself. Good news came to the shepherds. The shepherds responded by sharing the good news. But they didn't share it with just Mary and Joseph. As they depart, as they leave, they join their hearts and voices with the heavenly chorus, glorifying and praising God, Luke says, for all that they had seen and heard as it had been told to them. Did you catch that? You see the connection? The angelic chorus, remember, responded to the news of what God accomplished in the birth of his son by praising God and singing glory to God. And Luke is being very deliberate when he writes that the shepherds return to their lives glorifying God and praising God. Good news came to heaven and earth. Heaven and earth together responded in worship. Now this story of the shepherd's response to the birth of Jesus is so dear to us. And there's any number of reasons why. It tells us that God appears and that salvation is for the likes of the shepherds. And I think we enjoy that message because a great many of us are the shepherds. We aren't priests like Zechariah, and that we know of. We're not going to birth the second person of the Trinity anytime soon. But it's the revelation of God to the shepherds that bridges the gap between our stories and the story of the Scripture. 
Now the ordinary and miraculous, like we said last week, are on one single continuum. See, shepherding was a normal kind of appreciated occupation, roughly equivalent to being a grocery store clerk today. It was especially appreciated in a Jewish culture where the sacrifice of lambs was such an important part of religious and economic life. Shepherds were neither despised nor idolized. They weren't hated and they weren't celebrities. These were just ordinary folks living their ordinary lives. And while they were doing so, the news of Advent came to them. The Lord made known to them what he had done. God has fulfilled his promise of salvation. God has sent his son, born of a virgin, to be salvation not just for the people of Israel, excuse me, but for all people, the whole world. And in reply, the shepherds get in on the fun, becoming messengers themselves and singing in unison with the heavenly choir. But what I find interesting is that Luke doesn't record the shepherds saying any of this when they depart from encountering the angels. The good news of great joy for all people actually kind of recedes into the background of the narrative flow. They go to Mary and Joseph and just make known what had been said to them. And they return on their way glorifying and praising God for all he had heard and they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. No detail, all generalities. Why? especially because for every appearance so far, there's been these biblically, biblical language packed announcements, all these details, all these interweaving of history and theology and scripture, and now we get nothing. Why? Luke, good story writer that he is, is counting on the recipients of his gospel, the hearers of his gospel, being good listeners. Luke has spent two chapters and he didn't have chapter and verse then, but he spent a long time, we'll just say that, unfolding the details of what had been told to them. Images of salvation, kingdom, and peace captivate our imaginations. How can this be, we think? What will this look like? And we ask all this until this multitude of images converges on a single announcement. Unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. No other information is needed at this point in Luke's gospel. No other angelic appearance is required. The announcement of the birth of a Savior has gone out to the whole world. The only question that remains to be answered is, having received the news of the work of God, how will you respond?